Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cancer Doctor Podcast. I am your host, Robert Carrillo. Today, we're going to discuss how a medical doctor evolves from being a conventional oncologist into a full-blown integrative oncologist and why this is extremely important for you to consider when you're selecting an oncologist after you receive a cancer diagnosis. And today's guest is Dr. Jamie Wasilenko. She is the founder and medical director of Cincinnati Integrative Oncology and Functional Medicine. And just to give you a little bit of background on Dr. Wasilenko, she graduated magna cum laude from Wayne State University in 1988. And she then attended medical school while serving in the United States Army. Thank you very much, Dr. Wasilenko, for your service. And she served in Bethesda, um, Maryland. She's also a fellow of the American College of Physicians and holds professional associations in the American Society of Clinical Oncology, Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society, the American Society of Hematology, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, and the Institute of Functional Medicine. That is a mouthful, Dr. Jamie. She also completed her internal medicine internship at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and her internal medical residency at Madigan Army Medical Center. And she received her uh, hematology and oncology fellowship at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center as well. She also did some postgraduate training in translational research and bone marrow transplantation at John Hopkins Medical Center as well. Uh, Dr. Jamie served at two of the Army's teaching hospitals and she proudly served for 17 years in the United States Army and where she enjoyed caring for military personnel. After she completed her obligations in the military, uh, Dr. Jamie joined the research team at Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Tennessee Oncology. Dr. Jamie left um, her private practice after 14 years to start her own telemedicine and to assist in the care of hematology and oncology patients that had complex illnesses and they were in need of such services as well. So she has the ability to serve patients remotely as well these days. And with all that said, and it is a mouthful, and I could say a lot more about Dr. Jamie Awasalenko because she has over 28 years of clinical experience now, and she sees patients with all types of cancer diagnosis. But most importantly, and this is crucial, Dr. Jamie knows what your oncologist knows, and she knows what your oncologist doesn't know as well. And so, Dr. Jamie, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate having you here on the Cancer Doctor podcast. Thank you, Robert. It's an honor and privilege to be here and to share my story and my awakening. And I just pray that it helps others. Thanks. You know what? That's a great place to start. Um, when we first met, which was during our cancer doctor pre-qualification process for your practice, you did cite a personal great awakening that happened in 2021. Could you, could you just in your own words explain to the cancer patients watching this or their caretakers, what happened to you personally and professionally in 2021 that we should know? So um, one of the things that I often share with patients as well is um, during the COVID pandemic, which um, was a challenging time for many people, um, it was during that time that I started to awaken to really a lot of concerns. Um, and during that time frame, I awakened and realized that I had only ever been trained to be a big pharma saleswoman, that there was an entire half of medicine that I had been blinded to, um, including, you know, just simple lifestyle changes that could be so powerful for patients, recognizing that the food industry had also become corrupted that there were many things that were in our food supply that were making people sick, the recognition that a third to two thirds of cancers are related to the, the American diet. How profound. So when taking care of oncology patients, not to be taking that into account, not um, sharing with them the importance of, for example, getting rid of sugar. Right, because we know that cancers are heavily sugar fed, yet most allopathic physicians don't recognize that. So, so it was one awakening after the next. I will share with you, and I and I had share with you part of my awakening was to see a naturopath 
So, so during this journey, I said, you know what, I'm, I've been kind of blinded to part of, of, of medicine. Let me see somebody who actually thinks a little bit differently, who has different training. So I actually sought out a naturopathic physician probably about two years ago, and, and she has helped me enormously. So I had had a 20 year battle with an inflammatory skin condition, had been on multiple antibiotics, creams, medications, nothing was helping. And so I actually saw this naturopath for a wellness visit. And we started talking about my skin, not really thinking that she was going to be able to help me. Um, and, and she brought out that, um, that H. pylori and small intestinal bowel overgrowth are, are linked to my skin condition, had that ever been considered. And I was very surprised. I said, well, well no, no, I, I didn't even know there was an association. And she goes, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so I did some gut testing. And lo and behold, that is exactly what I had. So she treated my gut problem that was really the root cause of my skin condition. And I went off all topical medicines, all of these um, medications that I've been given by my dermatologist, because my issue was not a skin issue. My issue was a gut problem. So it's a perfect example of why it's so important that our providers look at root cause problems. So, so unfortunately, and I hate to say this because I, you know, I am a conventionally trained allopath, but, but allopathic medicine has really become a disease management system. And we are really relegated to giving patients a pill for their ill, right? It's a pill for your ill mill. Okay. You, you have, um, said quite a bit in that opening statement i'm thinking about our viewers so for the layman that's listening to this and they've never even heard the word allopathic uh doctor what is what is by definition what is an allopathic doctor for everyone sure an allopathic doctor is what we would consider a a, a physician trained in conventional western medicine got it western medicine so the difference between that and let's say a homeopathic practitioner would what would a homeopathic do just as an, a contrast so so using natural therapies right yeah. and there, there's a lot in between right you have naturopaths you have functional medicine physicians a lot of conventionally trained physicians that have awakened and are awakening are saying wait a minute i'm not really getting patients better Right, it's one pill after the next, and then their, and then their statin that I put them on for their heart disease causes a CoQ10 deficiency, and that's led to them developing diabetes. Right, so so even some of the things that we're doing that we think are helpful to patients may actually also be giving them additional illnesses. So it really is so critical that we look at root causes. Right. So, so I love the functional medicine tree because you have a big tree and then you have the roots. In allopathic medicine, we're all up here, right? We're looking at, you know, diseases that have developed or are developing and we're so siloed in how we treat patients. It's, I've, it, we're sending them to multiple specialists. I'm sending you to the dermatologist. I'm sending you to the cardiologist. I'm sending you to the neurologist. When the reality is their problem lies at the root of what is going on and maybe manifesting in all of those ways. So, so they're not really going to regain health until the root causes of their downstream illness is addressed. And so, and that's what I love about functional medicine is it causes you to say, okay, we've got lots of stuff going on here, but what's really going on down here? And can we make some changes in your diet? And can we get you exercising? And can we get you sleeping better? And can we get you to relaxing a little bit better? And maybe we're adding some anti-inflammatory supplements and that's going to dampen a lot of what's going on up here. So very powerful. Uh, yeah, which really what you're saying is we've gotten stuck in Western medicine treating the fruit, but not the root of the disease. Correct. Okay, Correct. got it. You, you, and 
Yeah, we're going to get into a lot of these topics, but you said something that was very powerful, that two-thirds of cancer today may be very well due to diet, the things that we're consuming, uh, putting in our mouth. And when you said that, you mentioned about the food industry as making us sick. It's it's corrupt. As um, an American, and we have food in abundance all over the place, right? Uh, we can go to fast food. We can just about get anything we want to get. But how is it that it's hurting us so much? What What is it about food in particular that would turn, possibly turn cancer on at a root level, not fruit, but just the root of it all. How can that be? I have to eat every day. How can it be poisoning me like that? Excellent question. Before I answer the question, I do want to make sure you're aware and our listeners are aware of the testimony of, I think, two very credible people, professionals. One is Callie Means, who has been become the co-founder of True Med. He actually was a consultant for the pharmaceutical industry and for the food industry. Gives a very powerful testimony on how a couple of the tobacco companies bought out food companies and used their scientists to make food more addictive. I'll let listeners seek him out if they really want to hear his full testimony, but very powerful. His sister, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, her name is Dr. Casey Meads, and she was a Stanford-trained surgeon who walked away from her practice when she realized the extent of corruption in medicine. And so, so I would ask listeners also to kind of seek both of them out. She's actually since written a book. She has a great website with some holistic information on that for patients as well. But here is another physician who's saying there are some big red flags, there's some big concerns that, that allopathic training has been compromised. And you may have the best doctor in the world. I'm very passionate about patient care, but I was part of the problem. So your physician, as good as they as good as they are, and as much as you love them and respect them, and and regardless of you know where they de derive their institutional training, they may be compromised. And if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And so so that's part of what I want people to also be aware of. So so they have a very powerful testimony, and I think they have some information that they can also share that may be helpful for listeners. Back to your question, so the food industry was compromised, right? So, so 85, 90% of what is in the grocery store is not food. These are chemicals made to look and taste like food. I often tell patients you have to read the label. If you cannot pronounce it, you ought not eat it, right? That is a big red flag that this is a chemical. So, so when you read ingredients on a box, there should be few in number and there should be things you can pronounce, right? It's rosemary, it's flour, it's olive oil, right? All right, that sounds pretty good. So, so we have got to be, we've got to be more sophisticated as consumers. And, and, and I hate to say this because I think many of us, myself included, Many of us have kind of gotten a little bit lackadaisical and we're all busy, right? I used to think feeding my family was telling my husband which stofers to put in the oven that night. Truly, truly. I was part of the problem, right? right. So, so, so now I can tell you we are, we are dramatically, we, are, we have gone a great distance from that because now we're cooking our own food, right? My husband's cutting up organic vegetables. I have crock pots going. I'm freezing in Pyrex. So that, that is our frozen food. So really when you're in the grocery store, most of your business should be in the produce aisle and preferably organic. Um, so it is so critical that we start to awaken to food is foundational. Food is medicine. Hippocrates said that long ago and it is so true. I pull out this diagram for all my oncology patients that shows a cancer cell 
with all of these signal transduction pathways going down to the nucleus. And it shows where foods target those anti-cancer pathways. How awesome is that? I go to national meetings, I go to national meetings, and they show me, they show me a chemical, a pharmaceutical chemical that targets one pathway. Well, I can show you green tea and curcumin that targets multiple pathways, right? So this is to me is incredible. So we have to we have to start recognizing what food really is. So, so back to your point, what they've done to our food supply, everybody needs to be questioning this, right? They have stripped our food of fiber, vitamins, and minerals. They have filled it with sugar, inflammatory oils, colors, chemicals, preservatives, have encased it in aluminum and plastic for you to buy and take home and superheat to your it superheat it in your oven for your family, and all of that leaches into your food. So it's no surprise that food is making us sick, right? It's poisoning our gut microbiome, which also helps our boost our immune system and it helps detoxify us, just as one example. So, so food has become inflammatory. And to get to your point, so we have toxins in our food supply, we have compromised ability to detox, and we have inflammatory diets that cause inflammation in the body and they cause obesity. So, so one of my other awakenings to re was to realize there are obesogens in our food supply. Really? There are things in our food supply that one, it's food has become more addictive, right? The, the sugars and the fructose corn syrup, so people are overeating, but there are things in our food supply that can cause mitochondrial uncoupling and you can't burn those calories. So you'll have patients that say, I'm eating like a bird and I can't lose weight. I believe you, I get it. So, so part of that solution is to really relook at our lifestyles. Um, so, so inflammation in a patient, remember that is a root cause, right? We're down here. That inflammation may manifest as an autoimmune disease. It may manifest as a skin condition. It may manifest as their inflammatory bowel disease. It may manifest as cancer. So oftentimes inflammation can sit on top of our tumor suppressor genes, okay? And that can allow cancers to go unchecked and flourish. Everybody, every day develops cancer. Everybody, every day, right? So we have genetic events that are occurring on a regular basis, but an intact immune system that is not being poisoned, that has real nutrients in there, that can help correct those, uh, that can help facilitate DNA repair, that's intact. It can recognize abnormal cell. Immune system can attack. The immune system can force it to undergo apoptosis if we have intact tumor suppressor genes, right? Super important. So, so for us, food is foundational. But yet in conventional oncology practice, I was not telling patients any of that. It was all about the chemotherapy. It was all about the side effects. And, and so there can be a role for conventional oncology treatment. But there is such an important role for these, for getting to the root cause of your cancer, to getting to the root cause of your inflammation, to modifying your lifestyle in a truly meaningful way. So, so Dr. Nasha Winters, just to, to share with you, has a very powerful story. She is a cancer survivor who actually lived to become a naturopathic oncologist. She wrote an excellent book, which I, I so, so not everyone can afford to see an integrative oncologist or a functional medicine doctor um, or a naturopathic oncologist, right? They're also few and far between. Some centers are extremely expensive to get into, but, but this book really talks about anti-cancer diet, ways to detoxify your life, and she comes at the she comes at cancer looking at the terrain 10. I love it. The terrain 10 should have always been part of the plan, 
right? Let's get you on some anti-cancer foods. Let's get you fasting during your chemotherapy, which will, which will supercharge your normal cells, increase their glutathione so they can be resilient and withstand the, the side effects of chemotherapy. And that will weaken the cancer cells and they won't have the sugar they need and they won't be able to make the glutathione they need to rescue themselves. So it is a perfect, simple, free maneuver that every oncology patient should be aware of. Now, I can't say everyone should do that. I think their physician has to direct that. Some, people's, some people have brittle diabetes. They're going to need more help than that. Um, but just such a simple maneuver that can have such a dramatic effect, right? Lessen my side effects? Make my chemotherapy work better? This is awesome. So, so the Terrain 10, the metabolic approach uh, uh, for cancer by Dr. Nasha Winters, I think is a must read for every oncology patient, frankly. And actually, we give a copy as part of our membership to our practice because it is so important. And it's such an important message. I want to recap what you, what you mentioned, because there was a whole lot there and it's all very important. But so if I'm understanding you correctly, the food industry has been compromised and, and part of the compromise is that food has been developed to become addicting to the consumer. And furthermore, it's loaded with chemicals and maybe, maybe those chemicals are there to make it addicting, but it's, it's a toxin and it's hurting us at a foundational level in our guts. And it turns on inflammation in the body that may end up presenting itself in a variety of illnesses or diseases, cancer just being one of them. And so having to address the root cause of the, of the condition itself is crucial. But unfortunately, allopathic medical doctors are not trained in that way of thinking you know? all. Uh, and you can see that even for yourself, you are part of the problem and part of your enlightenment came from visiting a natural path just for a skin condition that you had and they got cleared up because uh, right. obviously your skin looks fine. Uh, by the way, how long did it take for that skin condition to clear up once you started addressing this? I'm curious. And probably within two to four months. Okay. All right. Yeah. Takes right. time, right? Takes time. Um, and you made a recommendation for Dr. Uh, Nasha Winters. What was the name of her book one more time? It's The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. Metabolic Approach to Cancer. Yep. Okay. So, so I actually printed this off Dr. Means' website, and I just wanted to share it with you and with our listeners, right? Yes, absolutely. This, this is profound, okay? So she has um, nine illnesses that are listed, right, that um, Americans need to be aware of. And this is titled, Americans' Health is, it, it is Being Destroyed. Number one. 74% of American adults are dealing with being overweight or obese, 74%. Okay, something has dramatically changed in the last several decades, right? You did not see, obesity was very rare in the 1960s and 1970s, right? So now it's, uh, it's so ubiquitous, close to 40 for, 40% of children are overweight or obese. 52% of American adults, 52% have prediabetes or diabetes. We have a problem. Diabetes is also a very pro-cancer condition. As sugar goes up, as insulin grows, goes up, cancer risk goes up. So insulin is actually, insulin and insulin-like growth factor, as well as sugar, all stimulate cancer cells. Super important. 30% of teens have prediabetes. One in 36 children are on the autism spectrum, up from one in 150 in the year 2000. 34% of young adults have mental, emotional, or behavioral disorders. A third of young adults. Incidence of early onset cancers have increased by 79% in recent years. 
nearly one in two Americans is predicted to get a cancer in their lifetime. This is the first year in America it is estimated that there will be over 200 million, no, I'm sorry, 2 million new cases of cancer. So let me restate that. This is the first year in America it is estimated to have over 2 million new cases of cancer, and it's going up every year. Lastly, autoimmune diseases are rising rapidly, with some studies showing 3 to 12% risk annually. So, so these are important numbers. They are profound. What is this telling you? This is telling you our lifestyle and food supply are a big part of our problem. It is not a pill that your doctor is going to be able to give you, right? This is something that we have to address fundamentally. We have to address it as, as a community. We have to be strong in our, um, our desires to improve our health. And we really have to come at food in a completely, with a completely different respect. So, so one of the reasons we ended up in the hot, hot mess that we're in is that years ago, a couple of decades ago, the USDA, FDA came out and said fat is bad, right? Low, you need to be on a low fat diet, which by default meant high carb. High carbohydrates are what uh, is, is one of the biggest problems in our food supply, right? Extremely inflammatory. It's also leading to obesity. It's also leading to insulin resistance. So, so recommendations from on high by people that we trust have, have really changed the food pyramid. And so one of the things that that's really why I want people to listen to Kelly Means' testimony, because he explains a lot of why that has happened and how that was fostered and how Big Food has given grants to universities to agree with some of these recommendations. So, so we have got to be our own advocates. We have got to do our own research. We can't just do what the doctor says. Okay, the article, I'm assuming, I think it's an article or the testimony of, of Dr. Means, it was, that you were quoting just now. Was that from this year, 2024? Yeah, it's, it's on her website. It's on her website. Okay, perfect. Do you, can you give us the URL to that website so people can find that testimony? Um, so, not off the top. So, no it's... Don't worry, we'll, 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 we'll just go we'll to... Yeah, yeah. So, so also it's what's Dr. Casey means. She also is found on Instagram, Dr. Casey's Kitchen. But I, I would encourage your listeners to also, you know, support um, her website. I would encourage them to subscribe to her newsletter. I think it would, you know, obviously it's free and it's going to give them helpful information. Okay. The more that we can awaken, the more that we can recognize that allopathic medicine has become part of the problem. Because we don't realize that we were corrupted. Medical schools, uh, hospital boards, the AMA, the FDA, many of those institutions are funded by the pharmaceutical industry. Does the pharmaceutical industry have influence over those organizations? I think likely. Yeah, and it, you know, it's a little conflict of interest, right? I mean, the pharmaceutical industry, well, they want to provide a pill for the ill, right? Um, something um, you mentioned uh, regarding all of this was, in so many words, you're, you're, you're letting us know that the patient must be their own advocate. They must fight for their own health and wellness. They cannot depend any longer on a conventionally trained doctor because it's going to be a pill and it's not going to address the root cause. And so you mentioned there must be this radical lifestyle change for the patient, including the, the food supply, where they're getting their food supply. So my question is this, specifically to the cancer patient, why is it so important then and I, and I think you've already answered it, but I want you to elaborate again. Why is it so crucial for the patient to have a permanent, and my emphasis is on permanent, lifestyle change 
after being diagnosed with cancer. In other words, if they don't permanently change their lifestyle, then, because what I'm hearing is the hope of having a good response uh, with cancer treatments may be all for naught because they're not going to change their lifestyle. Why is this so crucial to do this? So excellent question. Um, before I answer it, I do want to make one just final comment about what we were just discussing. Mm -hmm. We have to recognize natural substances cannot be patented. Mm -hmm. Okay. So very important. So there are some things that can be repurposed that might be FD approved for other indications. There might be some supplements that patients can go on that have a synergistic or have an anti-cancer effect that your oncologist doesn't know about because it can't be patented. So they're completely blinded to it. Mm -hmm. So a quick example of that is melatonin. Mm -hmm. Melatonin at appropriate doses, which is higher than our sleeping dose. Melatonin is a potent antioxidant, a post potent booster of the immune system, can lessen inflammation, can lessen VEGF, which is angio, which which perpetuates angiogenesis and cancer, can be a great adjunct to your chemotherapy, right? So, so, and I'm not saying everybody run out and get melatonin and start it. I'm just saying that that is a good example of something that's pretty inexpensive that can be synergistic with somebody's chemotherapy. So there are there are reasons that we just need to be aware of that that natural substances have been maligned and profaned and naturopaths and functional medicine and functional medicine physicians are made to look like quacks. Sure. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so you 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 got to question the narrative because yeah. what we're doing based on the numbers I just gave you does not speak to us being in a very effective healthcare system. No, no, we're, we're, we have uh, higher uh, rates of cancer, right? Uh, though we've been fighting but, it uh, allegedly for 50 years, it hasn't but, gotten any better, so. Yeah. But, but are, we, are, we, are we making people better? Are we eradicating disease? No. No, no, no. we've become a disease management system. So, so I, I did. I just wanted you to and our listeners to be aware of this whole issue about patent and natural therapies. So those things aren't going to be in your oncologist's armamentarium because the the system has been heavily influenced by the pharmaceutical industry. The the um, I think I'll I'll leave that there. So so let's talk about lifestyle modification for cancer patients. So. I have a lot of uh, concerns about patients receiving chemotherapy in conventional oncology practices, clinics, universities. There are some very, you know, well-established institutions that are still feeding their patients sugar, donuts, cookies, soda, and juice as they're getting their chemotherapy. If, you're, if our patients are in any of those facilities where that is happening, they need to be questioning what else their, their provider isn't aware of. So, so another good example is, is you have nutritionists, right? You know, our loved ones are losing weight. They're sent to see a nutritionist who gives them a case of boost at 45 grams a container and says this is going to help you, right? That is part of their problem. Their cancer is heavily fed by sugar and we're giving them big carbohydrate loads. So, so I, I did want to bring that out. It, it Frankly, it's become one of my pet peeves um, because that should never be taking place. We should be teaching our patients that they need to be looking at more of a ketogenic lifestyle. They need to be eating cruciferous vegetables that are anti-cancer and that detox them. They need to be eating 9 to 15 phytonutrients daily because that will give them chemicals they need to help fight cancer and also to detoxify and to help them heal and it'll feed their gut microbiome. They need to be on fiber because fiber not only lessens inflammation, it feeds our gut microbiome and it detoxes them. Right. 
They need to be on probiotics. 70 to 80% of your immune system is sitting around your GI tract and it's being poisoned every day. So patients will not respond as well to their immunotherapy if they have a sick microbiome, right? So, so there are so many facets to this. But, but back to, your, to, to answer your question, lifestyle changes are fundamental. We have to recognize, and this is, gonna, I hate saying this, but we have to recognize our disease management system profits off you getting sick and keeping you sick. So I have a hard time explaining why an oncology clinic would be feeding patients Oreo cookies and juice when they're getting their chemotherapy, when in fact they should do, be doing exactly the opposite. So it is really important that patients, your doctor can be super smart at their, at their part of this, but they are missing bigger pieces. And I tell patients this, sometimes you may be the smarter person in the room, okay? Sorry. Because if, so, so think about how, uh, you, I would ask my physician, so how much training did you have in nutrition in medical school? Did you have a class? Some medical schools don't even have a class. Others, they may have a class, right? But you who are reading and researching are going to know so much more about nutrition than your doctor. So, so back to food is foundational, and we've talked about this. I tell patients, I'm very, I'm very honest. If you can't change how you're eating, I cannot help you. It is so foundational. So yet we have oncology patients that are getting their chemotherapy, they're ringing the bell, right? They're going out to dinner with their family and nobody's t taught them or is teaching them to really look at the terrain 10. And part of the terrain 10 is your lifestyle. It's, are you getting eight hours of sleep a night? Are, and why? Why do you need eight hours of sleep a night, Robert? You need eight hours of sleep a night because it's when you detox. It's anti-aging. You'll have increased Alzheimer's risk. You will die sooner if your body cannot shut down, get its eight hours. You're, that, again, is when you detox. That is when you're repairing. It also lessens your cortisol in the morning when we're not getting enough sleep because we're on the crazy American hamster wheel. Our cortisol level goes up, our insulin spikes, we get central adiposity, we get belly fat, we get visceral fat, we get fatty liver disease. All of that is pro-inflammatory. Fat is very pro-inflammatory. All of that is pro-cancer, right? So, so just another really good example, and that's sleep. So there is so much they need to be looking at. Exercise, hugely important. Everybody needs to be doing 30 minutes a day. Well, there was a study done in breast cancer patients that showed the anti-cancer benefit of exercise was similar to the anti-cancer benefit of their chemotherapy. Right? Yeah, the irony of it all. Um, yeah. So, so I just, so that's exercise. But I always... So, so I give a handout to my patients. Sunlight is therapy. What? I should get in the sun? Yes. Sunlight's going to increase your vitamin D, D which is very anti-cancer. It's going to boost your melatonin, which is very anti-cancer. It's anti-inflammatory. But sunlight, everybody needs to be getting sunlight every day. They've shown lack of exercise, lack of sunlight, are equivalent to smoking for cancer risk. Wow. Hugely pro-cancer right? So we've got to turn off the TV. We got to turn off the electronics. We need to get back to nature. There is so much that God, and I use the Hebrew, Hebrew name Yahuwah, there is so much that Yahuwah provides for us in nature to help us heal. It's amazing. So, so another perfect example, doesn't make big pharma money, excuse me, does not make the pharmaceutical industry money, is forest bathing. In Japan, it's known as Shinrin-yoku. I love it. Kind of, sounds kind of cool. And it doesn't mean you take your clothes off in the forest. So, so don't be alarmed. Okay, 
Forest bathing is taking a hike in the forest. Don't get Lyme's disease and blame Dr. Jamie. That's my other, that's my disclaimer. But taking a walk in the forest will increase your NK cell activity, increase the enzymes in your NK cell so it has an anti-cancer effect. It helps you sleep better, it lessens your stress hormones, it lowers your heart rate and improves your blood pressure. So another beautiful example of something you can do that can help you and lessen all these other things and help you live your life and enjoy it. Okay, that, that was a, a great answer as to why it's so important to, for a patient to undergo these lifestyle changes because, and I'm not, I'm not quoting uh, Dr. Uh, Wasilenko, so this is just my own personal opinion based upon what she's described everyone as you're listening to her. We have a major problem because the sales model in the healthcare industry is not to get you better, it's to keep you sick and to sell you something else. That's the sales model. They are circling their customer, which is you, the patient, by just creating a new ill, whether it's with a new food that's addictive or another prescription drug, but you're never getting to the root cause. And when you hear Dr. Jamie, who has got over 28 years under her belt as an oncologist saying, hey, guess what? If you don't get out in the sun and you don't exercise on a regular basis, these things have become a liability like smoking tobacco. That's crazy. That's absolutely nuts. Um, and the fact that in oncology departments, patients are receiving chemotherapy by being, while at the same time being fed sugars, that, well, that's equivalent to, uh, I don't know, stitching somebody who's bleeding out and there's somebody else uh, nicking them with a razor blade and providing new cuts on their body somewhere, right? That's really what she's describing. And, you know, the time has come for really for all of us to take personal responsibility for our health care. Dr. Jamie, I want to ask you a question. As an oncologist, by definition, what does it mean? And the key word here is treat. What does it mean to treat cancer in allopathic medicine? Uh, what does that mean exactly? I treat cancer. There are national guidelines and standards that are all developed by allopathic conventionally trained experts that we follow. So those are called the NCCN guidelines. They're typically updated um, quarterly, and these are felt to be thought leaders in the area. Most insurance companies will not pay for treatments unless they're in the NCCN guidelines. Those are the standards. And some of those standards, again, may be appropriate for someone who has a cancer that is aggressive and highly curable with chemotherapy. So I'm not saying they shouldn't receive the standard therapy. What I'm saying is the box has become way too small. Okay. We've got to think outside the box. Their, their oncologists, like I said, they could be top drawer in their field but they probably don't know what they don't know. And so that's where I want patients thinking outside the box, right? They can be cleaning up their lifestyle even if their oncologist doesn't know that, right? They can be exercising, they can be grounding. And that's another, that's another just easy, free thing, free modality they can do. Go outside, take your shoes off, come into contact with the earth. It will work like an antioxidant. When we have, we have so much damage every day, which, which generates reactive oxygen species, those reactive oxygen species will grab on to electrons wherever they're close to, to try to, to complete themselves, right? To, might, to try to make themselves whole. So if they're near um, your DNA, it's causing DNA damage. If it's next to lipids, it's causing lipid peroxidation. So they're causing all kinds of damage. We have to have enough antioxidants every day to balance that out, right? And so you're not getting that in the American diet. So, so I often give my patients a, a table called an OREC score, O-R-A-C. And that's the oxygen rea reactive absorbent capacity. And it gives you a ranking 
per 100 grams of how much antioxidant is in your food. And the highest on the list are spices. I love this, right? Oh. So when I learned this, I'm like, I threw out all my kitchen spices and I got all organic spices and I spice up everything, right? It's cardamom in the coffee, which actually inhibits cancer stem cells, by the way. It's cinnamon in the coffee. It's turmeric. So, so amazing. But the other, the, I guess the other part of this is grounding. So, so when you come into contact with the earth, which has a negative charge, and you've got lots of extra reactive oxygen species going on here, which have positive charges, that will work as an antioxidant, a very powerful free antioxidant. You can do that by their grounding shoes, their grounding sheets, you can touch a tree, you can get a walking stick, you can, you know, uh, go outside and get your feet on the ground, you can kneel in your garden. But again, it's one more, one more plea to get out into nature because Yahuwah uses his creation to heal his creation. Okay. You mentioned those guidelines. I want to go back. They were the NC, NN guidelines? No, it's NCCN guidelines. So, so the national guidelines that your conventional mm -hmm. uh, physician uses, and I follow because I still do some conventional oncology, mm -hmm. um, but every patient I treat now, I may be following the NCC and guidelines, but we're talking about fasting and melatonin and vitamin D and everything that I've already mentioned. Okay. So... And there was something really important that you said when you mentioned the NCCN guidelines. You mentioned if it's found in those guidelines, medical insurance will pay for it. Is, was that correct? Did I hear that right? That is correct. Okay. And if it's not found in those guidelines, example, eat this kind of food, it's not getting paid for. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. Because patients are always asking us, the cancer doctor, why doesn't my insurance pay for this? Why doesn't my insurance pay for that? Well, you just answered it. It's not in the end CCN guidelines for cancer patients. So here's the next question. Um, who can legally, in the United States anyway, who can legally treat a cancer patient without losing their medical license? Does it have to just be an oncologist or can it be just a family physician? Who, who can technically treat cancer in the United States legally without getting in trouble? So, so it has to be an oncologist. So okay. there, there are different oncologists though, right? There are surgical oncologists, there are radiation oncologists, and there are medical oncologists. Your medical oncologists are the ones that will specialize in basically all systemic therapies, whether they be chemotherapy, targeted oral drugs, immunotherapies. So we kind of do all the systemic therapies, um, but it has to be an oncologist. Okay, you mentioned a medical oncologist, a radi, a radi, radiology. Right. right. So mm -hmm. I don't do radiation therapy. Right. That's a whole another specialty where they right. use radiation to target the cancer, and then right. surgical oncologists. That was it, surgical oncologists. Okay. Right, and <laughs> so so sorry, some of those surgical so their surgical specialist could be a urologist that specializes in renal cancer removal, could be a gynecologic oncologist. But there is a surgical aspect of that where they have expertise on removing the cancer. Right. Okay. Got it. That, that I'm sure that is going to be really helpful for, for those listening uh, to this. Then, so here, this, this begs the next question because a lot of uh, patients with cancer that are looking into integrative or holistic type of methods will connect with some healthcare professional that are that is not an oncologist and they believe that they're getting treatment for their cancer so legally that's not the case but by definition it's not the case either so what are they actually receiving with these other healthcare professionals that are not oncologists but that are telling them they're treating their cancer what what's so, happening there yeah, I'd have to know specific details, but I will say, for example, there are some functional medicine doctors that might give IV vitamin C, right? Mm -hmm. So they can't specifically and are probably not completely addressing their cancer because they don't don't have training in integrative oncology. But that functional medicine doctor is probably pretty smart at looking at root causes that could be helpful for the patient. 
they might be able to give certain therapies, right? They might have other IV nutraceuticals in their office, IV ozone. They might be able to offer certain forms of um, hyperbaric oxygen, as an example, or pulsed EMF. They have some tools which can be helpful. So, so for example, right now my practice is, is purely consultative, right? We partner with patients, I have a team, we help them with integrating holistic therapies. But if I think that patient really needs mistletoe or they need IV vitamin C, I will send them to one of my functional medicine colleagues to make sure they're still being able to access that therapy locally, if that makes sense. So functional medicine doctors, some natural naturopathic oncologists, may be using holistic type therapies, supplements, nutraceuticals, to treat cancer or, or benefit cancer patients, but they have to be very careful with saying and, and advertising that they're treating cancer. Got it. So to recap that for our listeners, if you're going to a medical doctor that is not an oncologist, and maybe they're a functional medical doctor and they're providing some natural substance to you. Example would be a, a vitamin C infusion, or maybe it's a naturopath and they're providing some type of supplement to you or some type of herb, whatever that might be. Really, they are treating a patient, not treating cancer, but treating a patient that has cancer and what they're providing them is an adjunctive therapy to come alongside of their conventional medicine that they're receiving, maybe from an oncologist who's administering chemotherapy. Would that be an accurate statement, Dr. Jamie? What I, I just think that was so well stated. So absolutely okay. agree with that. Okay, great. So here's, oh gosh. So, and this point that we're making right now uh, for the viewer, it's, it's, it's so important to understand this because the, the services, uh, that Dr. Jamie is now offering, if you if you listened carefully, she is really performing a role now where she can provide oncology services, but also she can team up with a patient to source them out to other reliable healthcare professionals that are providing adjunctive therapies that she cannot provide. In other words, she wants to circle her patient with the very best modalities for those individuals that are dealing with a cancer diagnosis to give them the very best context for recovery from that condition that they find themselves in. Would that be, would that be fair, Dr. Jamie, as far as describing your practice and how you're, you're doing it these days? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, although I hope over time to be able to offer mo more modalities at our location, but we have just recently opened, right? So, right. so as our practice grows, I anticipate that some of those needs we will be able to do internally. Mm -hmm. However, right now, the, the bottom line is we're here to make sure the patient is getting the highest quality oncology care. And if that means I need to send them to a colleague to be able to get an infusion, then we do that, right? It. It's really okay. about the patient. Okay. And I don't think we mentioned it, but you know, you're, your practice, the Cincinnati Integrative Oncology and Functional Medicine, uh, you're in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, in case we didn't mention the location, but that's where you're at. Yes. Now, can, so here's another question. It's an important one. Can a medical doctor who is not an oncologist, can they legally administer a chemotherapy agent to a patient with cancer? Are they allowed to do that legally in the United States? No. No. Okay, great. That's That's fantastic to know. Okay, um, so anybody listening to this uh, right now, if you are going to a medical doctor who is not an oncologist, is administering a chemotherapy uh, to you, you probably need to stop doing that uh, in the United States, right? Find a professional, contact someone like Dr. Jamie, who is, is integrative, and uh, maybe set up a consultation you know, with her. Dr. Dr. Jamie, 
And I know your patients call you Dr. Jamie, so I keep on calling you Dr. Jamie, though I'm not your patient. But Wasilenko is a mouthful as well. <laughs> so I tell all my patients they can call me Jamie or Dr. Jamie, whatever works for them. So I'm totally good with that. That's fantastic. Okay. So what does it mean, uh, Dr. Jamie, for a medical doctor to establish a patient doctor relationship? What, is, what does that mean exactly? Why does a patient have to enter into that kind of relationship with a medical doctor before getting guidance from them? So, so it's a good question. I think it's really kind of a mutual contract on both ends, right? That you'll maintain privacy, um, that you know they'll adhere to certain you know office policies. For example, um, it's kind of rules of engagement, right? It's rules of engagement. And also whenever you're in a practice situation, that provider can then be giving you individualized instructions, doses of medications, be monitoring you for side effects, which is vastly different than saying um, tumor, tumor's good for cancer, right? So, so you need to have somebody that's gonna help you navigate, rotate your nutraceuticals if that's what you're doing, to lessen side effects, but also to lessen um, treatment resistance, for example. So it's very, so, so for example, I had a lovely patient call me recently and he has read the book, How to Starve Cancer by Jane McClellan. Mm -hmm. um, and I think she's, she's amazing, right? She's done a great job. She also has an excellent website. Um, but so he read this book and he's got his wife on doxycycline okay mm -hmm. so yep. doxycycline can be repurposed as an anti-cancer drug but that is something you really need to be working with somebody who knows what they're doing because you're also greatly affecting their gut microbiome and she's on an immunotherapy and data su suggests that antibiotics will lessen immunotherapy effectiveness. So here he is, he's doing it by himself. You know, he loves his wife. He, you know, is trying to do the best he can. His oncologist doesn't really, he's not on board with all that. So he's doing what he can. So, so that is just a perfect example of how you could be doing something that you think is good, but there are some other things that may be having a negative impact on your loved one and you just have no idea. Yeah, th this is a great point that you're bringing up because um, there are many individuals out there now um, that received a cancer diagnosis and they they become converts to a different way of addressing their cancer. They want to do something integrative, holistic, et cetera. And in their zeal for this, they'll start finding things and introducing them into their body without any professional guidance from a, a medical doctor that's integrative like yourself that can help help provide that very targeted guide guidance that they need in order to not do damage in another area of their life or their physical body. So biology is so uh, complex at times, right? With some of these things, but that's where someone like you comes in. And so in my, in my world, the way I'm thinking about this, if somebody gets a cancer diagnosis and they're like, I'm not going to do conventional, that that's not i'm not doing it i'm doing something integrative and i need first thing i need to do in the united states is i need to find an oncologist someone that is trained uh licensed uh, can legally give me chemo if i need to take that but i need someone that maybe thinks differently about chemotherapy and is going to provide me with other types of natural substances the recommendations address my diet i need that kind of teammate on my team where do i find this doctor maybe they go on cancerdoctor.com they find dr jamie wasilenko they contact dr jamie they said hey i found you on cancerdoctor.com i saw this podcast i just got this diagnosis i think i want to sign you up on my team i think i want to establish some type of patient doctor relationship with you and obviously these things are not paid for by uh insurance we made that clear because we're not going to find them in the uh, NCCN guidelines, right? So they're going to have to pay out of pocket. And if that hurts you, uh, and speaking to you, the listener, if that hurts you, the time has come to begin making significant investments into your own health. Uh, with Health is wealth. And without the health, you have nothing. 
your health is more important than your houses, your cars, and all the other toys that you could ever dream of. So it is time, I think, to start investing out of your own pocket into your health. So they contact you, want to invest in you. They make that investment. The first appointment that they have with Dr. Jamie, the cancer patient, first appointment, how long is that? What does that look like? Because they've already been to an oncologist, uh, conventionally minded, and they, oh, the records show they spend about on average 10 minutes with them when they see their oncologist. What's gonna be different when they see Dr. Jamie, who's also an oncologist, but she's got an integrative approach. What does that look like? Thank you for that thoughtful question. Um, I, I do want to, before I answer it, state that there are um, occasionally integrative oncologists at universities, at big hospitals. And unfortunately, those integrative oncologists are hamstrung. Mm. And what I mean by that is traditional conventional oncology that is chemotherapy driven is what is going to be recommended at that facility. So that integrative oncologist may be wonderful. They may be able to recommend some things that are helpful, um, but they are not gonna be able to treat your cancer holistically. They might be relegated to ginger for nausea, aromatherapy, and acupuncture or healing touch, right? Extremely superficially limited, right? Very painful. And so in that setting, your insurance company might pay for you to get an integrative oncology consult or maybe a grant. But if they're not talking to you about meaningful changes or helping to treat your cancer with some of these modifications, then, then you are not getting a true integrative oncology consult. So that's my first comment. My second comment is, so, so because I have functional me medicine training as well as integrative oncology training, I spend a lot of time with my patients. So not only do I go over their conventional records, I look at what they've had, I look at the NCCN guidelines for them, I look at their pathology, I look at their genetics or their next generation sequencing. So I look at the conventional piece of this, but I also have them do about two hours of functional medicine questionnaires before their first appointment, which is a lot, right? And then it's 45 minutes before they ever see me also reviewing their answers to their questionnaires. But it helps me target vulnerabilities. Some of those are root causes, some of those are vulnerabilities, which gets back to one of the things that you alluded to earlier, that not only do we wanna change these now, but these have to be permanent changes over your life or your cancer is gonna be at risk of coming back, right? So these are meaningful, dramatic, lifestyle changes that perpetuate health and healing and not continuing in a disease state, right? So, so, so a lot of what I uncover also helps them with other health issues. I promise nothing, right? There are no guarantees in life. But, but if I start working on root causes to try to lessen inflammation, to lessen fueling cancer, a lot of times other things are starting to get better, right? My back hurts less, my skin is better, my autoimmune disease is going into remission, my sugar is much better controlled. So a lot of that is an offshoot of that because I'm dealing with roots and some of the, the fruit, as you will, the upstream issues will start to also dampen. So, so what I initially do is very time consuming and I spend about an hour and a half to two hours with the patient on a first visit. They see me about a week later, one to two weeks later, we spend another at least hour and a half together. And then I spend probably at least two hours outside of that visit looking at functional medicine, their labs, their plan. So, so in total, I, I spend anywhere from five to six hours on every patient. Now, in conventional oncology practice, a new consult these days in Cincinnati is typically 30 minutes. You'll be fortunate if you get somebody that'll be six, spend 60 minutes on your case, and they're gonna be focusing on NCCN guidelines and treatment plan, and that's really it. Um, so, so that is the first consult really spans, it has to span two visits because it is so much of a time investment for the patient and myself. Um, it really takes about five to six hours. 
So that is their initial consult. Wow. Okay, that is uh, significant. It's definitely not 10 minutes or the 30 to 60 minutes that they're going to get with their conventional oncologist. And speaking of their conventional oncologist, uh, some patients have made the comment to me, you know, I was with my oncologist and I made these other natural recommendations and they said, they just kind of like, yeah, yeah, I paid lip service to it. But at the end of the day, they, they just did basically the cookbook recipe for my cancer. They said, this is what we're doing. And that's the end of it. But in your case, it looks completely different. After five to six hours, you could say, okay, here is my recommended game plan for you to minimize your vulnerabilities that you already have basically like a risk assessment in order to win this game here's the best things that i can recommend to you at this point in time is that correct am i am i adequately uh representing what it is that you're providing to the patient dr jamie so yes sir the initial two visits is our initial game plan right mm -hmm. so again discussing terrain vulnerabilities it may be during that, depending on the patient's situation, that I'm recommending um, additional testing. Could be functional medicine testing. If I think gut dysbiosis is a big issue, a fuel of their cancer, and we're going to have to deal with it. It could be um, RGCC testing, which looks at circulating tumor cells, and they do some they do some genetic testing, but one of the things that I think that company does that, that I find helpful is they do chemotherapy and natural therapy sensitivity testing. So that can better help me target treating a cancer if that's a patient that I'm going to be working with to actually treat their cancer holistically, right, or as maybe a post-conventional therapy maintenance plan so that gives me some guidance other than my best guess right um so i think that can also be very helpful so what i'm seeing is the initial consult we got a great great game plan initial vulnerabilities patients get a huge amount of education in that time frame um we talk a lot about anti-cancer diet intermittent fasting what all these lifestyle things do to boost their health but then at that point, the patients can decide, this is great information, I got what I need, I'm just going to go back and, you know, uh, work with my local oncologist. Um, but patients that really want us to, to target their terrain, to work with them on those vulnerabilities, to manage their cancer over time, that really requires that they, they uh, come on board with my team, and that requires a membership. So, and those memberships are in 12 month or one year um, commitments because it's a it's tremendous commitment again from both parties, right? So we're partnering with them to try to get them uh, on the path of healing and, and giving them lifestyle modifications that provide them meaningful long-term long change and lessens their recurrence. So that requires my team. I have a functional medicine dietitian. I have a healthcare coach, um, and, and I will leave things intentionally vague. But a couple of my my staff are are cancer survivors, and so they're an inspiration to me and the other patients. So they're living this out, right? So so what they say has a lot of weight to me and for my patients. There's been some uh, some studies written regarding the patient doctor relationship and how important that relationship is for recovery uh, when someone's facing a, a disease or some type of condition. So let's just say hypothetically that a patient comes to you from out of state. Maybe maybe they came from, I don't know, as far away as Nevada or something. They find you they They want to work with you. They do these initial appointments. Maybe they're the appointments are remote, you know, telemedicine type meetings. They go through all this time with you. And then at the end of the day, they conclude the following. Dr. Jamie, I love you. I like you. I want to work with you. And I don't want to see my Nevada oncologist. I'm willing to get on a plane and go to Ohio because I want, I want you to do the whole thing because I trust you. That's just the bottom line. Is that something that they can do? I mean, can, can, can you treat them with the 
chemotherapy side of this as well in your location or what does that look like? Because I know of some patients that are, they fit the description of what I just mentioned, right? It happens because they trust a particular individual and trust is important for healing. That is um, an excellent question. I can do some stuff a little bit more remotely that is conventional, but the patient is going to end up having to drive to see me. Um, so, so I do help um, and contract at other facilities really to help keep them afloat. Uh, and I provide conventional, conventional oncology care in addition to doing as much integrative care as I can there. So, so it is possible but I can work with their conventional oncologist. So, so it's also gonna depend on how willing their conventional oncologist is, how willing they are to think outside the box. Okay. So I can certainly do things um, to help them in that regard. Now, I am licensed in eight states. I can see anyone from any state if they come to Ohio. Um, but I think for re me really to do meaningful telemedicine, uh, consultation for them that it, it depends on their state, but it would probably require licensure for me in their state. So, so I'm a little bit limited in, you know, I can't be doing telemedicine oncology consults for Alaska. Um, but I can do a lot for patients if they're in a state that I'm licensed in, or if they're willing to come to Ohio. Got it. Which states are you licensed in really quick? So, so I'm currently licensed in Ohio, Kentucky, Virginia, Tennessee, Texas, Michigan, Kansas, and Iowa. I do have an IMLC. I can actually get licensed in any state pretty quickly because of that. Okay. Um, but for patients really to use my team, I think they have to have a significant local presence because my dietitian's not going to be licensed in all of those states. And you really don't want a conventional dietitian unless she's had functional medicine training, right? right? She needs to hand you something other than insurer boost. Okay. Okay. So, so patients that are closer to the Cincinnati, Ohio marketplace would be even more ideal, obviously, right? In this, in yes, this, sir. In yes, sir. So, so for example, Indiana, I don't have a license in, but Indiana is, you know, it is a neighboring state. So it's very right. easy for those patients to see me here. Okay. Fair enough. So I know we, I, I want to respect your time. You have been generous with your time uh, today. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that I should have, or something that you want to express that's important to you before we wrap this up? Yes. I think I just want to reiterate something that I actually had said earlier, mm -hmm. um, was that I want to encourage every cancer patient and everyone that has been touched by cancer to think outside the box right, to do some of their own research, to look at the importance of diet, to, to, you know, at a minimum, if you can't see a naturopathic oncologist or an integrative oncologist, um, then I would look at, is there a naturopath or a functional medicine doctor you can work with locally to at least try to shore up some of your root cause uh, issues? I would invest in, you know, Dr. Winter's book on the metabolic approach to cancer. There are many other excellent resources. If you go to my website, ciofm.org, ciofm.org, I actually have um, a page there for references and resources, and that will include some books there, that will include some links there. And, and so patients may not be able to come see me. Patients may not be able to do the, the to, you know, travel the distance, or they, they may not be able to afford a membership. But there are some excellent books and resources there on how you can radically change your lifestyle, which may help you go the distance, may help get that cancer into remission. So super important. I also have Momovation on there as a link. Excellent website. I did want to say we are being so, so sickened by our personal care products. Women's personal care products have over 160 uh, 60 toxins. Tampons, 85% of tampons are contaminated with glycophosphates. This is terrible. 
So we have really, and I love this website because they examine multiple products. This is not the industry giving you a comment, right? These are, um, uh, you know, these are women who have come at looking at personal care products and having them analyzed, and they're giving you information on which is the least PFAS contaminated toilet paper you can buy. So, so super important, right? And so I've got some links on there also because part of your healing is going to be lessening the toxin load. So it's not just the food, it's kind of, we got to look at everything. Since 60 to 100% of what we put on our skin, we absorb. So yep. we shouldn't put anything on our skin that we're not eating because we are eating it through our skin. And you got to think about how, what are you washing your clothes in? Because that residue is on you all day long, right? So those types of organizations help us think outside the box. But anyway, so what I wanted to really say is there's some excellent books. There are, and more than I can contain on my website, Chris P. B. Cancer has a powerful story. There's radical remission. There's how to starve cancer. So, so Dr. Winter's book I like because it lays out the terrain 10, but there's some other powerful books there that should be part of your educational journey. And so, so I'm just saying it, it's wonderful if somebody wants to come work with me and my team. For some patients, it's just not practical, but there are some good resources on that site that may help them as part of their journey. Fantastic. That, that was uh, some valuable information. So once again, everyone, if you want to find Dr. Jamie Wasilenko, go to her website. It's ciofm.org. That is uh, C is in cancer, I is in integrative, O is in oncology, F is in family, M is in medicine.org. Go there. You can get in touch with her. Dr. Jamie, I just have one last question, and this is um, somewhat of a going to become somewhat of a tradition at Cancer Doctor. So we ask a past guest who will remain anonymous <laughs> to ask a question of a future guest coming onto the show. And so I have a question for you that's been presented to me from a past guest that I want to ask you. Okay. Uh, so here it is. Uh, assuming there's no barriers. Uh, of ability as far as cost or education. If Dr. Jamie were to do a different kind of work, if you'd never became a medical doctor, if you did something else, what would it be? I like that. I like that. <laughs> I, I, I really think I would be a naturopathic oncologist. I want to thank you for being um, who you are. Thank you for your heart, your spirit, your attitude, uh, your commitment to what is true. And what is helpful for the patients that cross that cross your path uh, i'm so very grateful for individuals like yourself that exist here in this country that are out there keep up the good work dr jamie make sure you get your eight hours of sleep because we need you, <laughs> I, need you to, I need you to get into the office full of energy and uh i look forward to the next time we can talk again okay awesome All thank right. you so much it was a pleasure all right. God bless. God bless.